Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is Dadvice TV Live, episode number 278. Wow, who would have thought we'd have that much content helping us live better and live longer with kidney disease? Now, if you're new, welcome. Great to have you here. You're definitely going to want to subscribe. And you're going to want to hear what we have to talk about today. Now, as many of you know, when my kidneys were at stage five, the one of the worst symptoms, actually what I believe was the worst one for me, was anemia. It just zapped all of my energy. I felt like the old Carol Burnett show, that character that walks really, really slow, those teeny tiny steps. That's what I felt like, getting up from bed, Walking to the bathroom, I take a break, hold on to the wall, <sighs> catch my breath, and I was not living in a mansion. It wasn't like it was a whole big distance for me to walk. Anemia was my worst symptom. And once I was able to kick anemia to the curb, woo, it was like I was given my life back. And that is what we are going to talk about today. Now, my guest, you guys all know him, you guys love him. He is the author of, I'm going to still say it, the best kidney book out there, even though I've now written my own book. <laughs> his, his is full of facts. He's a nephrologist, so his trumps mine every day. But the author of, let me grab his book right here. Oh, I thought I had the right button and I had the wrong one. Uh, right here we go the author of Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease. This is a book that makes understanding kidney disease, knowing when to worry, when not to worry, all of that. When should you be starting dialysis? Helping you make sure you don't start dialysis too early. All of that and more is here in Dr. Rosansky's book, Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease, which you can get at TV dot com slash book that'll take you right to it on amazon or you can visit your local mom and pop store and they will be able to order it for you all right so let's go ahead and let's bring in dr rosansky so we can get started talking about anemia you know the, the symptoms of kidney disease how to you know uh, manage anemia get it under control with diet iron pills medication He's got everything we need to know. All right, let's bring him on here. Dr. Steven Rosansky. Hey, Doc. James, how are you, James? Hey, doing great. Good, good, good. Always good to see you and always great to be on your show. I actually look forward to it. And I, 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 I rave about what you're doing, James. I think you're doing great stuff. James, should I introduce myself in terms of my history and so forth? Oh, yeah, because we always get new people here, and they need to know why it's important to listen to you instead of those people selling the fake cures and the woo-woo out there. Right. Well, I am a retired kidney specialist. I still work at the free clinic, um, and I have over 40 years of experience treating people with kidney problems. Uh, I've also done a lot of my own research, and my research has been recognized, especially in the area of kidney disease progression and the issue of when uh, to start dialysis regarding levels of kidney function. And that particular work of mine, I have many papers on that topic, um, has actually been called the game changer, uh, my original work, Game Changer in Nephrology, because I demonstrated with our work that uh, starting dialysis early may actually lead to a shorter, not a longer survival. So that's pretty important stuff. And um, yeah, I've, I've got about 100 publications and uh, I've taken care of thousands of patients with uh, different kidney problems. And we're going to discuss something that is very near and dear to my heart. And you'll hear why in a little bit talking about anemia of kidney disease. And one thing that I mentioned to James, a lot of you folks say, okay, I went to my doctor, I got my EGFR. Everybody should know, I guess, what that EGFR is, your kidney number. And it doesn't hurt to repeat it. It is just an estimate of your kidney number. Nothing hard and fast, very variable. It can go up and down by 10, 20, 
Don't panic about your EGFR. I think that's worth saying every time I get on your show. There's so many people get their lab result and they panic. Um, the uh, EGFR issue is one that everybody uh, on this sh- that, that watches this show has has been told, and a lot most of you have what we call uh, stage three A EGFR in the uh, 30 to, uh, to 60 range. Um, act, yeah, so 3A is actually EGFR of 45 to 60, all right? And, um, and everybody thinks, okay, I got that EGFR, it's 55, I must be symptomatic. <clears throat> Unusual to have symptoms with kidney problems. You don't get pain with kidney problems. You don't get symptoms with kidney problems. It is called, I hate to use this term, it's very trite, stereotype, the silent killer, because you will not know necessarily that you have a kidney problem, but you will know if you are anemic, it is very likely that if you have symptoms that they may be caused by anemia, which is very common in kidney disease. So let's just get right into it, James. You ready? I'm going to be quizzing you, so I hope you're on your toes tonight. All right, I'll be on my... Don't make me say the A word. <laughs> okay. I'm going right. to practice that one day so that I can surprise you and say it without stumbling. <laughs> okay. First of all, what is anemia, James? <laughs> it is, and I'm going to take a guess. I don't know what the exact term is, but your body has low oxygen, and it's usually because you have low hemoglobin which is in your blood, it goes to your lungs, picks up oxygen, and delivers it to all the cells throughout your body. Great description. But simply put, anemia is when your red blood cells, you got red blood cells, you got white blood cells. When you have a short supply of your red blood cells. And as James elegantly told you, those red blood cells, you need to carry the oxygen to all parts of your body. And if you need energy, and we all need energy to do anything we're doing in our daily activity, you need to get oxygen to your tissues. And those red blood cells carry the oxygen. Very simple. What is, why do we talk about anemia with kidney disease? Why is anemia so common with you folks that have kidney disease? James, you want to take a crack at that? Is it because we have trouble with iron? that's what mine was good that is one of the reasons i give you a i give you a star on that you can can you give me one other really big reason okay i can't think of one okay all right so there's decreased production of something called epo 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 is a big word it's called erythropoietin this is a hormone. We got lots of hormones. You got thyroid hormone, but erythropoietin is another hormone that your body makes. And guess where you make it in your kidneys? I I what? knew that. I should have guessed it because because I always had trouble saying that word. Erythropoietin. Okay. Yes. All right. So now, what does that epo do? What does it do? Do you have any idea? It tells your bone marrow. Hey, make some more red blood cells. The bone marrow, right? You people have eaten bones of of steaks and so forth. The marrow is where the blood cells are produced. The EPO will get your bone marrow to make more red cells. And when you have kidney disease, simple, you can't make enough EPO. And when you can't make enough EPO, you get anemia. Now, the next big question is, when should you expect to have anemia? At what level of kidney function? I'm going to guess in the 20s. For sure. But you can start seeing it commonly uh, below um, 45. You might even see 30 to 45. See, that would be 3B. Just, by the way, all of these A, B, you know, the various C, K, D, one, two, three, four, five. These are just things that we docs, academic docs, research docs, 
we, we want to be able to talk to each other. And so we categorize it. There's nothing hard and fast about it, but that's a range. So, and then certainly if you're CKD4, which is EGFR below 30, you can expect likely that you will develop anemia. And as your kidney function gets worse, and you don't make EPO at all, you can expect the anemia to get worse, okay? Now, and James mentioned this, why else do we get anemia? You just said it, what did you just say? Remember, iron it, deficiency. Yeah, iron deficiency, that's iron, what mine was. I'm iron, sure it was other things too, but that was the number one cause. Iron, but, and, and, you know, and, and James, at, I don't know how long you had a decreased uh, EGFR, because you had, uh, without going into a lot of detail, I'm sure it's in your book, which I will recommend. I'm going to get a copy of it and I'll be able to talk intelligently about it. But um, if you have a significantly decreased kidney function, you're likely to present with anemia, not uncommon. Okay. Mm. But the anemia can be just because you know, your kidneys aren't making that EPO thing that stimulates your bone marrow to make the red blood cells. So why uh, do folks with kidney problems get iron deficiency, like James said? And the important thing is you can't make red cells without iron. You need the iron. And especially if any of you folks out there are, are on the drugs that are like the equivalent of the EPO, and we're going to get into that in a little bit, you got to make sure you have iron or the drugs won't work. So why do folks get iron deficiency? You have any guesses on that, so, James? So for me, I'm guessing I mm -hmm. was not eating very much. I couldn't keep anything down. I was constantly throwing up everything. And I pretty much lived off of like Gatorade um, and crackers and very little for about three weeks. Is that why? Yeah, yeah there's no question that you can get iron loss uh, partly from your diet. But that's not the big one. That's, that's relatively small. The common way to get iron loss is when you have blood loss. And there's many ways to get blood loss, and we'll talk about that in, in a minute. And then the other thing is, even if you have enough iron, some people with kidney disease, that iron is not going to be released. The iron gets stored in your liver, and it may not get released. So you may not be getting the iron to where you need it to manufacture the red blood cells. Other thing is, James, if you've got chronic infections or inflammation in your body, that's gonna be another reason why the iron is not gonna be available. But the biggie is you're losing blood, and that's an easy one, right? What are the common ways that folks out there are gonna lose blood? What's one of the commonest ones, which I have had myself, and it's a real common problem that we all have. We lose blood. I'll give you a hint when we go to the bathroom. Wait, you mean in your urine, you can lose that much blood? That's where it makes very, an impact? very, 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 very rare. Wrong end. <laughs> oh, okay. I got it. So when you're having a bowel movement. Hemorrhoids. 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 Got it. So Probably most people have had hemorrhoids in their life and hemorrhoids can bleed and hemorrhoids can cause you to be iron deficient. Common other thing, GI bleeding. A lot of folks are taking various NSAIDs, one of the common, you know, like the Motrin's. Everybody with arthritis is taking these pills and a lot of folks are going to get uh, blood in their stool from taking these. And then, you know, there's a lot of other ways that you can bleed from your from your gut. Some people actually have inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's, and also colitis. That will keep your gut from absorbing the iron. And here's another one which people don't think about. If you're in the hospital or you're sick and you're getting a lot of blood drawers, let's say they just discovered you got kidney disease and they're trying to work you up, taking a lot of blood, you can get anemia from too much blood being drawn, you know? Yeah, wow. yeah, very common. And and especially as you get advanced kidney disease and you go on dialysis, people on dialysis are getting blood drawings all the time. And they, they that's why we typically, dialysis patients, we give them IV iron routinely because we're taking the blood, we're taking the iron away, and they get blood in their di the dialysis apparatus, that filter that the blood goes through, 
some bloods in there. Getting back to GERD and 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 uh, bleeding from the GI tract. Get reflux. Lots of folks out there have reflux, and that's going to cause blood loss, and you won't know it. It's going to be slow loss of iron, blood loss, and then guess what? A lot of you folks are taking these PPIs, these drugs for reflux, like omeprazole. They not only can they decrease your kidney function, and I I've told folks here that the proton pump inhibitors, PPIs is the name of the type of drug that will uh, be used for people with GERD should be used short term because long term they can mess with your kidneys and they can decrease the iron uh, that you're uh, eating in your diet. Okay, so those drugs short term, maybe don't take them long term. Ask your doctor for other alternatives if you got GERD reflux. Okay. Well, yeah, my and, son had to take some, and I think they limited it to 30 days only and right. then to stop, and we were able to make a diet adjustment and stop his acid reflux issue. Exactly. That's, that's right on, James. And James was talking about diet. Now, we push plant-based diet, and I think the benefits of plant-based based diet will overwhelm the possibility that you're getting less iron, but you will get less iron in a plant-based diet. There's no question about that. And uh, you can ask your dietitian if you would like to get the foods in your plant-based diet, if you're a vegetarian, that have higher iron. And I'm not going to go through the whole list of them. Whole wheats are good for you. Spinach, you know, Popeye, spinach, iron, yep. pretty good. Nuts and raisins, pretty good. Asparagus green beans, just ask your dietitian if uh, if you're dealing with an iron problem and you're a vegetarian or you, and you're trying to stay with your um, your plant-based diet. And in, in my practice, and I've treated enormous numbers of people with anemia, it's so common with kidney patients, I would always check B12 and folate. These are other uh, vitamins. Rarely they will be deficient if you have a weird diet uh, that you can be deficient in vitamin B12 and folate. I'll check that for my patients and sometimes I'll give them a multi B vitamin. Um, now we're going to talk about the most important thing. What are the symptoms of anemia? And I want to drive this home because everybody says, oh, I got kidney disease. I got to have symptoms. You may well have symptoms. These are real related to anemia. First of all, how are you going to look, James, if you have anemia? What we're gonna look? What you're you gonna look like? Very pale. Right on. Great. What about uh, energy level? Super. Well, it's gonna be low. Mine got to where it was so low. It took me a while to work up to go to the mailbox. Yeah. Yeah. You're gonna have no energy. You're gonna feel tired, and actually, you may have other things that you wouldn't think about. Poor appetite trouble sleeping, yeah. trouble thinking clearly. You may feel dizzy. You may have headaches. If you have anemia, it's going to mess with your heart. Your heart rate may go up. You may have a rapid heart rate. If you're a patient who's older and your heart is weak, it will make heart failure symptoms worse. Your shortness of breath may get worse if you are getting worse than anemia and you need, you need that oxygen in all parts of your body. If you're not getting enough oxygen to the muscle in your heart, you may get chest pain, right? You can get chest pain from anemia. You can feel depressed down in the dumps, not uncommon in folks with anemia. You may have cold hands and feet. Not I remember shivering to where my teeth would even rattle at times with blankets. I just couldn't get warm enough. Yeah, uh, I, I like your I like your descriptions. <laughs> very very picturesque. <laughs> now, now one symptom I yeah. had is this from anemia. I yeah. had a non-stop cough. It was so hard to do the ultrasound too because of that. I I think the cough and and we will mention 
can mention this every talk. The aces and the arms. What are those? The aces? Oh, that's right. That's right. The aces, the aces cause the cough. The that's one of their They're symptoms, both, right? They're both the blood aces, pressure medications. The aces are blood pressure medicines. Yep. And they're extremely important for any of you folks with kidney problems who have protein in the urine. Please go back and look at that advice that I talk about this, because this could be the difference between you going into kidney failure and going on dialysis or not. Getting on the ACEs or the ARBs, these drugs, the ACEs are the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, like the PRILs, the captopril and allopril, can make you cough. And the TANs, low sartan, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the, uh, you have the, the prills and the TANs. The TANs, okay, no cough. Both of them will decrease the protein in the urine and slow your kidney decline. Important things, worth mentioning. You could be irritable, James. Anemia can cause I'm irritability. I'm sure I was. <laughs> And here's a couple of unusual ones. You can have brittle nails. I've actually seen that. Mm. Or spooning of the nails. I've seen that too. These are a little bit weird. And then another really weird one, which I've seen, is called, uh, you have, some people with anemia get cravings for odd things. It's called pica. And this is common. It's been described in pregnant women with anemia that they, they eat the red clay in the South. Not uncommon. Mm. They have this, this, this craving. So there's a lot of symptoms related to your anemia worth checking it out. If you have CKD and you've got some symptoms now, why should we treat anemia? I mean, I guess we just told you all those symptoms. You want to get rid of them. That's a pretty good. I don't reason. want to be miserable and my body right. needs you know oxygen. Good I'm idea. suffocating it. Yeah, definitely worth treating. I don't think anybody would argue, but one thing that is not often, considered is when you are anemic, you lose your kidney function more rapidly. Wow. How do you like that, James? That's another biggie. You want to treat- like an AKI possibly where you get the anemia under control? I don't, honestly, I, I don't have the original source material for that, but it is definitely in the literature. It's been described. I don't have the mechanism. That's a good question, uh, and I think I will look it up. You could be right. That could be part of the contributing factor. James is saying that people with anemia, especially if it lowers your blood pressure, if you get really bad anemia and you're bleeding, you lower your blood pressure, your kidneys can shut down temporarily, also called AKI or acute kidney injury. But if you treat your anemia, you're going to improve your survival. That's big, right? You're going to improve the function of your heart. Clearly, you're going to improve the quality of your life because those symptoms that we just described are pretty miserable. And James has eloquently described his own symptoms. Uh, and and your, your mortality and hospitalizations due to heart problems is going to be less. You'll have much more energy to do your daily tasks and, and to exercise. And not only does it slow the decline of your kidney function, not only does it decrease your heart problems, but it'll decrease your risk of having a stroke. So it's important to get the anemia treated. So now, how do you know if you have anemia, James? How should anybody yeah. know? Great. Okay. You're right on it. What now everyone with CKD, every one of you folks who has been diagnosed with CKD. And let me digress just for a minute because this worth digressing on. If your EGFR is over 60, we will not consider you CKD in today's world. A lot of your EGFR tests are no longer giving you a result over 60. Okay. That would be as long as you don't have protein in the urine. I would not consider that kidney disease. Okay. Over 60. Um, so if you have EGFR under 60, you got CKD, it's consistent. By the way, you need at least two values under 60 for the kidney docs to consider you as having CKD stage three. Um, so you should get your blood check every year. What is the blood test that you should have at least once a year? What is it called? You know, know the initial? Is it the CBC? 
Great, James, you are good. You're good. You're so, real good. I'll tell you, I took a guess because I get a lot of blood tests. Okay, very good, very good. The complete blood count. And by the way, just I'm digressing a couple times tonight. I hope you don't mind. But, you know, if a lot of doctors, a lot of hospitals take way, way, way too much blood. And it's like anything else. It's like if your doctor wants to draw a lot of blood and do a lot of blood tests and have you come back with multiple blood tests many times a year, question them. Is this really necessary? Do we need to take blood this frequently? Because that can give you anemia. So the CBC, complete blood count. What does that mean? It means it'll tell your doctor, and he can tell you or she can tell you, uh, how your red blood cells, the ones that carry the oxygen are doing, and the white blood cells, which you folks, the white blood cells you may know are the ones that will go up when you have infection. Mm -hmm. It's gonna tell you the type and size of the red cells and, and the white blood cells. What's the level? Uh, and it gives you the hemoglobin, okay? That's the, uh, the business end of the blood. That's what carries the oxygen. What level of hemoglobin in a man and in a premenstrual woman should you have above what level for a man first? Above what I, level? Any idea? Is it 10? No, no. Above 13. Above 10, 13. we're getting to be anemia. 10, you're in the anemia range, and we're going to get to that in a minute. Above it's so 13. much easier to read the labs when you have them because they have that normal range. Yeah, yeah, and you know yeah. where you are in it. Exactly. exactly. But there's a range, like, like James just said. So it's over 13. Men could be 13 to 15 or 16. <clears throat> Women uh, uh, should be uh, over 12 if you're premenstrual. Lower than men because the menses is going to cause women who are menstruating to have a, generally a lower hemoglobin. Um, and how do you know if you're iron deficient? So that's the important thing. You need to get your CBC done once a year, and you need to know if you are iron deficient. How do you know if you're iron deficient? Uh, James, do you happen to know what test we do? No. Okay. I'm not knowing which test, one it is. That's fine. We test your iron level, right? And the test of the iron level is called transferrin saturation. So what does that mean? So there's a protein that carries iron, and you want to know how much of that protein is saturated with iron. And you want to have it at least 20% saturated. So you want to get a transferrin, also called a T-sat, of at least 20%. The other test that you folks should have is a ferritin level. Ferritin is the blood test that measures how much iron is being stored in your body. That's the ferritin level. Should be at least 100. So these are the tests that your doctor is going to do to see uh, you know, if you got anemia and if you got CKD routinely should be, should be checked once a year. And if you are anemic, you can follow it up several times a year and we'll get to how it's treated in a little bit. Any questions so far, James, did I, did I throw you any curveballs nope, here? You're good. I'm trying to find my original labs to see where my red blood <laughs> cell and hemoglobin and all those oh, are. Okay, good. I, I do want to make sure I haven't confused you too much. All right. I did have so, over 400 on my uh, protein urine originally. I thought it was lower than that originally. But now wow. it's none. It's trace or, or none near trace is all it says. Cool, cool. So let's talk a little bit about the history of anemia. And I've been treating, as I told you folks with kidney disease for over 40 years. And back uh, before um, the 80s, it was rough, James. I can't tell you, I'll, I'll just give you a couple of quick stories. So I've had, I've, I, I, when I was in Montreal, I did some training at McGill in Montreal, really great program, by the way. Uh, we, we had some kids on dialysis and, and these kids were walking around with hemoglobins of four, five, and six. Amazing. Just so low. And, I don't and know how they walked. Yeah. I mean, they, it, it was mind boggling. It was mind boggling. And then your average older folk, um, if you don't have, you know, coronary artery disease and chest pain, you know, angina, that kind of thing, we would allow people to have hemoglobins in the six, seven, eight range. 
why didn't we trans? Because what, what can you do about it? You can transfuse them, right? I mean, if you got a low blood count, everybody knows you get a blood transfusion. Yep. Not a great idea. Why is that not such a great idea to keep giving blood transfusions? Any idea why we don't want to keep transfusing these folks? No, I don't know. Because you're going to develop antibodies, and these antibodies may make it impossible to get a kidney transplant. Okay. And especially in these young kids, you want to get them a kidney transplant as soon as possible. Anybody, and this will be for another show, but anybody listening tonight, if you've got advanced CKD and your doctor's talking to you about so-called kidney replacement treatment, which is dialysis, uh, certainly investigate the best option, which is kidney transplant. We don't have time to get into it tonight. But for those folks, you don't want to transfuse if you can avoid it. And we used to give these drugs called androgens, male hormones. Didn't work well at all. Did they not have EPO injections back no, then? No, not until the 80s, James. Not until the 80s. And James, I had, I had, uh, what do you call it? The uh, people that, Jehovah Witness. I had Jehovah Witness patient. I'll never forget this patient. Really nice fellow. And he was, you know, this is a religion. No transfusions. Yeah. Jehovah Witness, no transfusions. And we begged them and, and we get the family and no transfusions. I was able, this is before EPO was released by the FDA. I was able to get him compassionate release of the EPO saved his life. Yeah. Oh. So there are people who die because they refuse to get transfusions. And that was something that back before EPO, uh, we had to do for some folks. So, um, uh, you know, the, the, we used to use the androgens that didn't work. Um, and, um, so what is this EPO stuff? It's also called the drugs that people are taking, a lot of you folks who have advanced kidney disease may be on it. They're called E as in uh, egg, S as in Sam, A as in apple, ESAs. What are the ESAs? The ESAs are erythropoiesis. This is a big one for you. You're going to like these big words. Erythropoiesis stimulating agent. What the heck does erythropoiesis mean? Erythro, Latin, means red. It means stimulate red blood cell production, ESA. Let's call it ESA, make it simple. How do we get this ESA, this stuff, the equivalent of the EPO that your kidneys make? These, this was one of the first gene products. You guys know you have genes, you have chromosomes, you have the genes. This was the, one of the very first gene products. So what they did is they took a human gene, put it in a bacterium or some other, you know, agent and this is a little factory little epo factory and that this was called recombinant erythropoietin made with genes and uh these drugs um there's two types uh and some of you folks out there uh, may be on them uh there is the um the procrit or uh epo uh, erythropoietin or, or Procrit or EPO. And then there's a longer acting one called Darbo EPO. So those are the two. The Darbo is the one that has <clears throat> the longer half-life. <clears throat> so it's EPOGEN. Some of you folks may be on EP. They're equivalent. EPOGEN, Procrit, same stuff. And you folks that are on the longer acting drug, it's called Aranes or Darbo EPO. Those are the names that you may see on the medicines that you're getting. Now, how do we use it? So James was talking about the normal level of hemoglobin being 10, but that's about the time that we start thinking about giving you EPO because the normal level for a male should be over 13, for a female over 12, uh, for premenstrual uh, female. And, uh, <clears throat> but we don't want to give it, uh, unless you're down to nine or 10, any idea why, why don't we give it and get your hemoglobin back to 12 to 13? Is it, would it shock your system or would well, it be too high if you're too close? Well, I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. This is a real head scratcher. I thought back in, back in the day when it first came out, 
I wanted to get my patients to a normal hemoglobin. I mean, why not? You'll probably get them to feel better and make their heart better. But it turns out not a good idea. And I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. So um, if you're a dialysis patient, we want to keep you, uh, it, we won't start you on EPO until you're like nine to 10. Okay. And the way the EPO uh, is dosed, the, uh, the shorter acting one, if you're on dialysis, any dialysis patient listening, generally give it with your dialysis treatment, uh, maybe once or more a week. And then the longer acting, you can give every few weeks, generally five to 10,000 units. That's how we treat um, in today's world. And I'm going to tell you why we don't treat to a normal hemoglobin in just a minute. That's an important issue. Um, how do you treat iron deficiency, James? Eat more iron. <laughs> okay. I, I'll buy that. <laughs> but, but that's not going to do it. Oh, wait. There's an iron pill, but you got to be careful. It can stop things up. It puts the brakes on if you take too much too quickly. Okay, so the common iron pill that James is talking about is called ferrous sulfate, a real common dirt cheap iron pill. And like I said, I've had some bleeding because of hemorrhoids, so I take ferrous sulfate and that, that works for me. But some folks can't deal with it. It makes their stomach hurt. Some people may get constipated. There's a better iron pill, and you folks can get it on Amazon. You can get it over the counter. It's called ferrous gluconate. It's better absorbed, and it's not going to tear up your stomach, okay? Another trick for those of you who have anemia and you're on iron and you want to get the iron into your bloodstream is take it with vitamin C. Vitamin C can help you absorb more iron. So that's a little trick for those of you who are on iron and you're not getting your iron level up. You may want to try vitamin C. And then the other thing is you can give intravenous iron. It used to be that there was a form of intravenous iron that we worried about a rare anaphylactic reaction means a bad allergic reaction. There is new forms of iron that you can give intravenously one of my favorites is ferric gluconate. You can get that with an IV dose. Some doctor's offices may give it to you. Get your iron up very quickly. Take care of that issue for your anemia. So why not get the hemoglobin to normal levels, 12, 13? What we did, and I've been involved with these trials. As I mentioned, I've been involved with a lot of my own original research but I was also involved with a lot of the research studies. Any drug that you want to use in patients in this country, you got to get approval from the FDA, Food and Drug Administration. It goes through a long process. So I've been involved in a lot of the studies. And the studies were comparing if we get it to a high level versus a lower level of your hemoglobin. And we thought, like I thought, Hey, if we get this hemoglobin up higher, your heart's going to be better. You're going to feel better. You're going to function better. What they found, and this was very disappointing, is if you get over 11, you had a higher mortality. Wow. Over 11, a higher mortality. And guess what? If you were a dialysis doc and you were treating your patient you are, you're going to have folks monitoring your, your hemoglobin levels in your patients. And if you were over 11, they would penalize them financially. That's how serious it got. <clears throat> what they found is once you get over 12, you and this was especially in cancer patients, they used the EPO in cancer patients as well, that you started seeing higher mortality. Not sure what it's all about. Maybe it has to do with clotting events when you get the hemoglobin up with these drugs. We don't know the cause. And there's other, you know, less common concerns with the EPO can maybe raise your blood pressure, rarely can, uh, can cause seizures. And uh, for those folks on dialysis, uh, especially if the hemoglobin gets high enough, it can clot your dialysis access. Mm. So 
important issue, what is a good hemoglobin level? Okay, the goal for any of these drugs to stimulate the bone marrow, the ESAs, you want it to be less than 11 and a half. That's safe. Don't want to get over that. Okay. So, um, and, and not, not everybody's going to respond to EPO. Uh, why, why might someone not have a increase in their hemoglobin if they're given EPO? What could be the reason, James? Any idea? No clue. Well, you mentioned it earlier, iron. You need the iron ah. to get the EPO to work. So you got to make sure you get an adequate iron level. Otherwise, you're wasting money. The EPO is expensive. So make sure you get your iron level up before you start taking the EPO shots. So and is it normal for them to give you iron and then EPO? You, again, you check the iron sat, the T sat. You check the ferritin. If there's not enough iron around, Get the iron in first before the EPO. Absolutely right, James. Very commonly, people that have chronic infections of various types, and we'd see this a lot with our dialysis patients, would have infections in the grafts, their access. That could make it um, make the patient less responsive to the EPO. Now, are there any, you know, and Gloria asks this, are there yeah. any other side effects to the EPO inje injections? That's it. That's it. Okay. I mean, basically, that's that's bad enough. I mean, yeah, yeah. The higher mortality was very disappointing. And when you get to a higher level, uh, but if you're again, if you're below, you know, 11, certainly, you know, nine to 11, you know, you definitely want it, but you don't want to push it up over 11 and a half. Once you get to 12 or 13 or 14, that's not good. So th there's been a lot of head scratching, a lot of, you know, people worrying, why can't we get the hemoglobin higher? What's what's the deal with it? And there's actually, uh, some of you folks may have heard about it. These are shot, by the way, the EPO I'm talking about, whether it's the long acting, the ARNS, or the shorter acting pro procreate epigen injections, they're injections. Mm. And people give them, like you get yourself insulin, you give yourself the injections of EPO. Very easy to do, not painful, tiny little needle. And uh, like I said, you can give it, if you, those of you who are not on dialysis, you could take the long acting EPO once a month and keep your hemoglobin in good shape most of the wow. time. As long as, as long as you keep your iron sat up. Sometimes you may need it twice a month, but many people get away with just once a month. So that may be quite a quite a good deal for you. And and there's been a big push for oral EPO type drugs. There's and there's been a bunch and they've had some bad side effects. The only one today in this country that's released is a long that produced that it's, it's the only oral anemia therapy. Um, and yes, so, you know, the thinking was maybe this new type of therapy, which has a different mechanism of action is not going to cause the same problems as the, um, you know, as the procreate epigen or Aranis. And this is the this, this pill, uh, the, the 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 new EPO type pill is first change in this treatment in over thirty years. I'm not going to tell you it's it's like a long name. It's called HIFPHI. Anyway, um, is that one created it, by AstraZeneca? Because I know they're working on I'm not, anemia I'm not, treatments. It, it's this is released as that that pro. I think it's called that produce that that produce that. Um, but um, what the drug can do, it has some benefits. It may help with, uh, with getting some iron from your iron stores. And it works it's really cool. It works by, like the EPO is, is a gene product, right? Put the gene, the EPO gene, the human EPO gene in a bacterium, you make, make a factory to produce EPO. This is actually stimulating a, a gene drive, this, this pill. And um, we were hoping that it was going to uh, not have the problems that the, the EPO drugs have. No free lunch, James, unfortunately. Mm. The side effects of the oral drug are not much different than the injections. But it is an advantage of those folks who are, you know, a, a fear of needles. And uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, option for people who are either on home dialysis 
uh, or you know you got a, some CKD fours and fives that are not on dialysis yet. Pills pills are a great option. So I think we've got some time. We've got 15 minutes today, so we're we're good. Very good. So anybody out there, if you have questions that you'd like to ask Dr. Rosansky, go ahead, type them into the comments. And I've marked a couple. We've addressed a few of them. Now, here's one. It's a, a different topic, but it's a topic you know about. Katz asked, does the SGLT2 drugs, um, do those help reduce your protein in your urine? They do. They do. And um, we have talked about, if you guys and girls look up some of the, my previous advice TV shows with James here, I've talked about the SGLT2s mm -hmm. and the GLP1s. And I've also talked about these new weight loss drugs, o Ozempic. And um, I want to warn people just in general, this is not to be panicking. This is not to say that you shouldn't take any of these drugs. But newer drugs, you got to give them time before we realize all the downsides. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say, hey, you want to take the Ozempic the, for weight loss? It's a, if it, it's a great drug. If you continue to take it, that will result in weight loss. You want to take the SGLT2s. They're great drugs that can decrease the protein in the urine and slow the decline of your kidney function. But I recently read a paper about some potential adverse effects of the SGLT2 drugs. And I don't want to scare people with it. It's just preliminary information, but there may be some downsides to some of these newer drugs. The ACEs and the ARBs are around forever. You got protein in the urine, no question. Get on one of those drugs, not both, because both of them can decrease your kidney function, both types of drugs. You want to get on the maximum dose of an ACE or an ARB if you got protein in the urine. That will slow the decline of your kidney function. And, and the GLP-1s are on another type of drug that you can look at the prior discussion. Very good. Manny asked, is too much iron bad for you? Yes, indeed. There is iron storage problems. There's actually, there's a, there's a uh, inherited serious problem with iron storage. And it can give you, if it's extreme liver failure, if you get too much iron stored in your liver, it can mess you up. So you want to measure your iron set. You want to measure your ferritin. And without going into a lot of detail, because not many of your viewers are on dialysis, but I could tell you in dialysis patients, we tend to allow those iron levels to go up because sometimes we have to. But the question is good. Too much iron can be harmful. Absolutely. All righty. Sharon says she's taking Ozempic 0.5 mil milligrams or 0 0.05 milligrams. It keeps her blood sugar down, but it seems to make her eat more and her weight's going up. Any that, thoughts that on that? That is very strange because it works on the hormones that make you feel full. So I am not sure what's going on in that case. I can't answer it. And I frankly don't have personal experience because these drugs were not around when I was in practice. My only experience is from what I see in the literature and there's been a lot written about it. I think the drugs can be good. They're expensive. It can, it can be very costly. And, and I can tell you that if you stop them, the weight will come back. Uh, and I can also tell you, if you look at one of my recent talks, we talked about these drugs, we talked about weight. And one of the things that hopefully you came away with James is that, you know, we, we way, way overemphasize weight as being an issue for your health. It's, it's potentially an issue if you're morbidly obese, you, you know, you're, you're three, 400 pounds. But for those of you who are overweight in general, it's just one risk factor, which is not as important as getting your bad cholesterol down, getting your blood pressure under control, 
keeping your sugar under control, et cetera. So I, that's a, that's a strange, and you need to talk to your, your doctor who's giving you the drug. I don't have any idea why that would happen. All right. Dark man. Jeff says, um, he had a kidney transplant and <laughs> is it harder when the time comes to get a second transplant? Well, for most folks, as we were talking about, one of the reasons why we wouldn't transfuse people a lot, we try to avoid a lot of transfusions, is because of developing what you call sensitivity. So in other words, you develop antibodies against antigens that may come from the transplant, and that could cause you to reject the transplant. So with any transplant you're going, unless it's like from a, you know, a uh, identical match, somebody who's a twin, identical twin, you're going to have some different in the antigens, the things that stimulate the antibodies. So that can make the second transplant more difficult, but not impossible. Certainly many people have had two or even more kidney transplants. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, I know someone currently who is facing that same issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult for her to find a match. Yeah, right, um, right. And she's in and out of the, the ER every yeah. few days. Um, but she just had a recent surgery in the last couple of days and they're able to do dialysis again. Cool. Um, and she's hopeful finding a matching transplant. Um, yeah. Shannon asked, what was the name of the iron supplement that you mentioned for on Amazon? It was like Ferris. I wrote glucanate, something. Gluc gluconate, gluconate, G L U C O N A T E. Ferric glutinate. Easy on your stomach. Easy on your stomach. Very good. And for everyone watching this after the live, I will go to Amazon. I'll find the link and I'll put it in the description. <laughs> All right. Someone else wrote, I fluctuate. Oh, this is going to be interesting. I fluctuate between stage two and three A. How long can I safely take a PPI for acid reflux? Again, you know, the, the FDA approved it for, for limited time use because there is the potential to, to cause some kidney damage. And, uh, it, you know, you, you want to use, there's a lot of other uh, antacids and other drugs, some of the older drugs like cimetidine, um, that can be used uh, without the same kind of downsides as the PPIs. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't, th certainly not everybody who's taken them is going to get kidney problems, but I would limit the use if you can. Yeah. All right. Weapons man says any comments on pred prednisone? Is that how it's pronounced? Yeah. Prednisone is not used to raise hemoglobin. Prednisone is a steroid. Steroids are used in some people who have various types of kidney diseases that you'll find on a kidney biopsy. And we, there's so many of these unusual types of kidney problems. We haven't discussed them because they're fairly unusual. And we use uh, steroids or prednisone to treat them. To, to, I'll just throw out a couple of names. One is called membranous glomerulonephritis, big words. Uh, very common in kids, minimal change disease. Uh, kids may be on steroids or prednisone. Nothing to do with anemia treatment. All right, we have uh, two more here. Someone was diagnosed with FSGS. Any tips for controlling that? Okay, so FSGS is one of those glomerular diseases, okay? You all know glomeruli because you talk about the effect of glomerular filtration, the estimated GFR, glomerular filtration rate. And if you go to my book, I give you a good description of the parts of the kidney. The main business unit is the glomeruli, right? So we do kidney biopsies and we look at the glomeruli under the microscope. And there's a whole range of different types of diagnoses that we make by looking at the parts of the kidney under the microscope. FSGS, a focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, is one of the many types of kidney disease that will cause protein in the urine. All types of kidney 
diseases of the glomeruli, including and especially diabetes, which is the number one cause of kidney failure patients on dialysis. It's a glomerular disease, okay? Now, in that disease, we don't push steroids because it'll mess up your diabetes. But in most other glomerular diseases, including FSGS, steroids, and the other person just talked about prednisone, which is a steroid, are commonly used. But more importantly, if you got one of those diagnoses and protein in the urine, be sure to be on an ACE or an ARB and consider going on the SGLT2s or the GLP1s or the uh, other drugs like a plerinone or, al- or aldactone that we talked about, the aldo antagonists. Go back to the discussion of proteinuria and you can get that information I, in my talk with James. You are just full of so much information. I don't know how you pull all these drug names out of your... <laughs> A lot, a lot of time dealing with a lot of patients and a lot of prescriptions and, you know, it's like, it's like you could, you could come off the top of your head, all the stuff having to deal with cars, which you've been doing all your life. Oh yeah. Which I knew about. It just depends on what we do with our time. And I spend a lot of my time thinking about this and researching it and dealing with it, James. Yeah. Yeah. Now here's a question that Kat Katz has asked couple times tonight, and I've seen people ask this a lot in other videos. Are people able to see you in your office? I am retired. I only see people in the free clinic in Columbia, South Carolina. To qualify for the free clinic, there's a lot of financial uh, hoops you got to jump through. And I would be happy to see anyone who comes to our free clinic in Columbia, South Carolina. That's about the only way that I I'm, I'm seeing patients and, and I'm happy to answer your questions on this show, which I enjoy thoroughly. But beyond that, I'm not doing any private practice. Now, Roy asks, is there any chance without a transplant to end kidney failure? To end kidney? Well, I don't know if you're talking about end kidney failure. In other words, you're saying to reverse it, to undo it without a transplant. Well, the transplant doesn't undo it. So the transplant, I don't, he may, this question may be on the, on the track of the bionic kidney. In other words, are we going to manufacture an artificial heart, an artificial kidney? That is going to come in the lifetime of you younger folks who may be watching this. Not in, our, not in my lifetime, but it may come. Uh, and in terms of reversing kidney disease, don't believe the BS that you see on all those different pro- programs and people with white coats trying to sell you these, you know, kidney cures and kidney cleanses and these kidney pills. It's all BS. It is nonsense. Kidney failure will reverse if it is called acute renal failure. In other words, if you've got a cause for your kidneys to, to not be happy because your blood pressure dropped or you took some drug that they didn't like, they may not work temporarily. And within two, four, six, eight weeks, they may be back to normal. That's the only situation that they can do recover and come back to normal. There's no cure for kidney disease. You want to slow the progression. And more importantly, you want to decrease the word that James hates, atherosclerotis, hardening of the arteries, atherosclerosis, which is the commonest issue that you need to worry about if you've got kidney disease, because that's what causes people to die early, the complications of hardening of the arteries, and that risk goes up as you have lower levels of kidney function and higher amounts of protein in the urine. And we discussed that many times in in my dad by shows. All right, I've got a question of my own for you, which I think a lot of people don't think of, but it could help a lot of them. Can someone with CKD also have an AKI? Exactly. So it's called acute, not cute like cute looking, acute like um, short term on chronic kidney disease. So you can get an AKI on your CKD. So for example, your EGFR today may be 40 or 50. 
and you get an insult like dehydration, the commonest one, drop your blood pressure, you over, overdid your blood pressure drugs, and your EGFR may go from 40 to 50 to 15 to 20. That's called acute renal failure on chronic renal failure. That's it, James, exactly. Yeah, and that's very likely what I had. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the vomiting, the diarrhea, all that just pushed me too far, dehydrated me, put me into kidney failure once I got fluids and time and got on the right medication, uh, stopped my NSAIDs, things started to improve. Cool. But I didn't heal myself. I didn't cure my kidneys. I did not regrow a kidney. None <laughs> of that stuff. Didn't flush them, <laughs> unclog them. None of those things, those fake pills promise. Well, but I will say, okay, but an another cause of acute renal failure, common in, especially in men, is a big prostate. It can block the flow of your urine. I, you made me think about this, okay? Big prostate can block the flow of your urine back the urine back up into the kidneys, make your, your ureters, which come from the kidneys, dilate big time. Uh, and that could cause your kidneys to temporarily shut down some. And if you relieve the obstruction, put a catheter in, hey, it could be cured. Again, these are not cures, they're just reversing acute kidney failure. One, one last question, I know we're over time. I cool. just love your answer for this one. So for someone who's just got their their one lab and maybe it's you know one of those labs that gives you a number that i don't like and it's like oh no my 84 what's the cure for that usually yeah the cure again if your egfr is over 60 it's not kidney disease and a lot of labs have wised up to that they don't have reported over 60 and it's got to be under 60 more than once and then more importantly, three months apart, you need to check it three months apart. More importantly, it's the protein in the urine. Too many docs are not measuring your urine protein. Critical, anyone with CKD should have that measured. Get your urine protein measured and follow, not just your EGFR, but your urine protein. Very important. Perfect, all right, thank you so much, doc. We just went a little over our hour. Thank you, everyone out there. Appreciate you. If you'd like to learn more from Dr. Rosansky, he's here every month, but also grab his book, Learn the Facts About Kidney Disease. You can go on Amazon, and I got a link that'll take you right there to it. Go.dadvicetv.com slash book. It is definitely the book that every single kidney patient should have, and I wish when I was diagnosed, my doctor would have handed me this. Oh my goodness, it would have saved so much worry, so much frustration, because we all know the information out on the internet is all over the place, and there's so much bad, fake, and wrong information out there. All right, Doc will be back on June 12th, which isn't that far away, so we will see you then. Before then, keep an eye on Facebook, and you'll see any other shows that are coming up with Jen Hernandez or any other dietitians or others that I'm going to be able to squeeze in. And I hope everyone out here is enjoying the start of summer. And I'll see everyone in the next video. Bye, everyone. I hit the right button. <laughs>